Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Peter Stutz. He is the Chief Medical Officer for ElectroCore. He's also the Chief Medical Officer for the National Spine and Pain Center and the President-Elect for the World Institute of Pain. Peter, thanks for joining me today. Nick, absolute pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. So uh, for the benefit of the listeners, uh, you have a pretty interesting background uh, as a physician and some of the areas of focus that are entirely relevant to the discussion. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are now, if you would. Well, thanks, Nick. I, I started my career at Johns Hopkins where I took over a pain division. And when I say I took over, there was no pain division. There was a regional anesthesia group. And my boss gave me the autonomy to go set up a division of pain medicine at Johns Hopkins. And as a very young man, became chief of this division of pain medicine, where I ran a division for about a decade. And this was at the time frame of physicians like myself, who are anesthesiologists, starting to implement neuromodulation therapies into the practice and to become surgeons. And I was the first academic anesthesiologist in the United States to get surgical privileges to implant some of these devices. I later left and started a pain practice with one of my uh, uh, former fellows and uh, also co-founded a company called ElectroCore. My pain practice grew and grew and grew and kind of grew, uh, joined with another big group. And I'm now chief medical officer of National Spine and Pain Centers, one of the largest pain practices, if not the largest in the United States. And ElectroCore is the trendsetter for electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve to treat a variety of disorders, but our most notable and the forefront in the United States has been headache disorders. So I, it, I think it's important to focus on this, and you talked specifically about pain, and I think most people listening would go, oh, yeah, pain, I take a tablet for that, or, you know, I'm given a drug. But when you say neuromodulation, help us understand what that means and, and what it is that you came to sort of develop as part of this process? Well, certainly there are some patients with acute pain problems who can do well with an ibuprofen or a very simple approach, and I'm not really talking about that. There's a large percentage of the population who develop what's called high-impact chronic pain, and that may be as much as 16% of the population with uh, really a dramatic impact. Chronic pain is thought to costs the American people more than heart disease and cancer combined. There are a variety of disorders that make this very difficult to control, and it, don't, it doesn't work to just take a pill. We have to implement very specific therapies that are based on an accurate diagnosis to try to treat patients for their pain problems. One aspect, one of the therapies, one of the tools in our toolbox is the use of electricity to turn off pain signals or dampen them down. And that's really an area that I've spent a large portion of my career on is trying to figure that out and try to figure out how do we tap into the body's nervous system and ameliorate pain, ameliorate other diseases, and see if we can give people a better life. So it, it, it's not, I mean, it doesn't sound like too much of a stretch when you think about it conceptually. We have nerve fibers, they transmit electricity for want of another term. Um, you're, you're stepping into that arena. Tell us a little bit about the development of these concepts and, and go back in time. When, when did we first see anything that really started to offer any value in that process? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, depending on how far back you want to go. Um, we can start as far back as 250 BC, wow. where it uh, identified a clay pot with a copper insert that if you placed the steel rod and filled it with vinegar or some other electrolyte, it would create an electric field. And this was buried with some of the Rajas way back when, it's called the Baghdad Battery, was identified. And one hypothesis is, of course, that this was used for pain. Others are that it may have been for plate, plating of um, 
uh, uh, some kind of met metal on on other t on other surfaces. But the, most people think that this was a pain therapy. Scribonius Largus in 46 AD used the torpedo fish and placed it on the heads of people with headaches and arthritis and made their headaches go away. It's kind of an uncontrolled study, and I think the call for a, uh, the, the the need for an early a randomized controlled trial, because I picture these guys saying, I'm never coming back. <laughs> um, but I would say more recently, electricity has been part of the mainstay of healthcare. And we don't really think about it that way, but Earl Bakken in the 1950s developed the first pacemaker. And that company has become Medtronic Corporation. If you think of your, what do you do if you have a slowing heart rate is you put in a pacemaker. The standard of care now for patients with severe back pain, excuse me, severe back pain is spinal cord stimulation. And that's implanting electrodes on the spinal cord. And we actually are at the point now where we can talk to the spinal cord and the spinal cord talks back to us with some of the novel technologies. But, you know, we, go, we can go down the list and epilepsy, the best treatments that we have are vagus nerve stimulators. And so for some reason, I do think there is a bias against medical devices but medical devices that are able to access the nervous system and talk to the nervous system in a very controlled way, I think are among the best therapies that we have uh, in medicine. So it, it's interesting you say there's this bias against it. I mean, I, I can't disagree with you. And it's not that I personally have a bias, but my sense is that there, there does appear to be. Have you got some insights as to where or why that's the case? Yeah, not so much. You know, this is a drug society, I think. And I think people are used to thinking about, I take a pill and I get better. Or I've got cancer and I need to be on chemotherapy. Or um, I'm depressed and I need a pill. And, and, and our society is, is focused on that. And frankly, it's not the case everywhere in the world. Uh, some of the Asian cultures are more uh, um, embracing of technologies like this. But but having said that, um, I'm not entirely clear why. I, I think there is a bias, but I think the facts speak for themselves about what do you want to do when you have a severe disease? Electricity comes in frequently quite, quite often. Right. So um, fast forward, you know, uh, there's been a, a number of innovations. I mean, I, I, I got to say I'm blown away how far back this goes <laughs> and I, I got to go look up this torpedo fish because that's truly fascinating to me. But I, I, as you mentioned specifically, the vagus nerve is one of the specific targets here, not the only one, but certainly one of great interest. And, you know, certainly from my medical school career and, and medicine, I remember the sort of significance of that nerve. Tell us a little bit about why that's a target and what's significant about it. Well, it's interesting. You know, when I was an anesthesia resident, you alluded to my time as an anesthesiologist, uh, the vagus nerve was that nerve that I really did not understand that just got in my way when I was trying to place a central line or trying to, you know, get access to a patient's blood supply very quickly. But what I've learned over the last 20 years um, or a little bit more is that the vagus nerve is incredibly important. It's cranial nerve 10, also called the wandering nerve. It's the longest cranial nerve, and it is provides innervation to the brain and to the visceral structures, the chest, the stomach, the gut area. And it provides what I think of as generalized homeostasis, provides information to the brain about what's going on in the visceral structures. And it, the brain can then provide information back to the gut. Another way that I've termed this is that the vagus nerve is the command and control center. It allows us to control visceral activities. It allows us to decrease headaches by stimulation and activation in certain areas. It is really important. People think about spinal cord stimulators as being, spinal cords um, being, being very important. And if you cut the spinal cord, you can't walk. Similarly, the vagus nerve is important for other types of activities as well. And then finally, I would say is, you know, I, I grew up in Hawaii and I was a uh, Asian uh, medicine was part of the culture there when I grew up. And we've talked about mind over matter and mind over medicine. And I think I believe I'm a believer in that. But the way that this happens is physiologically based. 
And I believe that much of that is through the vagus nerve. So an incredibly important structure, been around teleologically since before we were human. And it is the command and control center controlling a lot of different functions. And when you start to get into things in deeper and deeper and deeper, the vagus nerve keeps coming up as being something that's important that's been unrecognized over really over hundreds of years. Clearly, tremendous opportunity when you think about the extent of that nerve and, uh, you know, the potential of its impact. There's been therapies implemented earlier in Europe, uh, but now available here. And in fact, you have uh, the electrocore or or gamma core uh, device that's available. Tell us a little bit about that method of action and what's going on in those instances. So the, the, I, I think they're all a little bit different, but the gamma core device stimulates the vagus nerve non-invasively. For most of your readers, they may not know what I mean by that, but simply put, we're not having to do surgery. Right. We're not having to implant an electrode. We're not percutaneously placing any electrode. And it is something that can be done by the patient in the comfort of their own home. It is a little handheld device that the patient puts a little bit of conduction gel on it, places it against the neck where the carotid artery, a pulse in your neck you can feel, turns it on until you get to a certain level of energy, and then we just hold it there for two minutes. So it turns out that the same frequencies work for a variety of different uh, entities, but our first four uh, clearances from the United in the United States were for the treatment of episodic cluster headache, And cluster headache is also known as suicide headache. They're just these awful, awful headaches where people just cannot get their pains under control. And the suicide rate is 23-fold the general population because they're so bad and such poor treatment. Uh, Prevention of cluster headache, acute treatment of migraines, and prevention of migraines were the first four indications. The prevention indication came just this past March. Currently working, when you say approved, there's data that shows it, it there's evidence of this. What, what are the results showing of that? So, so in each of these indications, we have done double-blinded, randomized controlled trials for acute cluster, uh, acute treatment of migraine, a prevention of migraine, and then a, a large study in what, what we call a comparative trial where we compare vagus nerve stimulation to standard of care, vagus nerve stimulation plus standard of care in a prevention trial for cluster. And all of these are really what we call state-of-the-art level one studies where the study compares it to either control or to a, to a sham or a placebo. And all of these studies have shown superiority over the, the predicate and an improvement in pain control. So for example, in one of our studies in the acute treatment of episodic cluster, one of the outcome measures was how likely is it are we going to get rid of 50% of your cluster attacks? And that was 64% in one of the studies. Uh, Other studies have shown 30% improvement, which means people go from having a suicide headache to completely gone. And so we take a look at what are the outcomes that we're looking for in each of these studies but in all of the studies where the FDA has had a complete and full evaluation, they've um, determined that our therapy is efficacious and safe. And that's the goal of the FDA in most, in most circumstances. Fantastic. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. And today I'm talking to Dr. Peter Stotz. He is the chief medical officer of ElectroCore. We were just talking about the uh, Gamma Core Sapphire and its use case in headache, uh, specifically the cluster headaches, um, uh, migraines, uh, and also the prevention in both of those, and, you know, some really astounding uh, results. But fast forward to today, and gosh, it would be almost no conversation I've ever had that we don't talk about COVID-19. And in what is, I guess, not a surprise, um, there's some relevance to all of this in the COVID-19 treatment that you've currently got going on today. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, One of the things that I didn't tell you is that when we started this company, Electricor, back in 2005 with some of my co-founders, J.P. Errico and Tom Errico, we all were interested in this, but I had a real personal reason to be very interested in this. 
Uh, my son had peanut allergies, had nothing to do with headaches. He was peanut allergic, and the lungs can shut down if you're, uh, the child is exposed to peanuts. And I was looking to see, can we tap into this neuromodulation? Remember, I was president of the Neuromodulation Society of North America, and I've been thinking about how we use electrical stimulation on the heart and on the uh, gut and other areas, and mm-hmm. nobody had been looking at the lungs. So we started a bunch of studies looking at just that with vagus nerve stimulation to see if we could improve airway reactivity. So if an animal or a human has got bronchoconstriction or shutting down the lungs, could we open them back up by stimulating the vagus nerve? And we laboriously figured out how to do that. We were, figured this out initially in animals. We developed this non-invasive approach. Bruce Simon invented this way of doing this non-invasively uh, with our group. And while we were studying patients in the severe airway reactivity, it was determined that their headaches went away. So it's kind of like a surreptitious finding that we realized that this could be so effective in headaches. But I never forgot what we, where we started on airway reactivity. But the company kind of moved off and started working in headache and some, you know, these pain areas. When COVID hit, um, I thought long and hard about what we had done previously, as well as a 20-year history of science on what's called activation of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway by stimulating the vagus nerve. And that's a, you know, that's a mouthful. But what other investigators had found is that if you implant a vagus nerve on an animal model and subject them to sepsis or other inflammation, you can improve their survival. So the three bits of information that I needed to think about this was, number one, we had data on airway reactivity. Number two, uh, there was a 20-year history of great scientific work by the likes of Kevin Tracy and others that showed that activation of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway could help animals in a septic model. And that COVID-19 um, is really a uh, not a very, um, it's not a disorder with high mortality unless it really activates your cytokines. And so when we looked at the cytokine elevation, what was known from Kevin Tracy's work and the airway reactivity work that we had, we tried this in a number of patients who happened to be physicians and scientists who got COVID and they seemed to improve. And we, we wrote a medical hypothesis paper that was submitted to and accepted for publication via peer review in the journal Neuromodulation this past April. But so there's all these little pieces of the puzzle coming together that we may have a therapy that can help in these patients with COVID. The FDA took particular note of our early clinical work, and they've granted us an FDA emergency use authorization for use of patients with asthma and airway reactivity who are experiencing exacerbation due to COVID to be used either in the home or in a, a hospital-like setting or healthcare setting to be delivered by the patient or by a healthcare provider for known or suspected COVID. So it's a really broad emergency use authorization that they've granted us. And I should just pause for a minute and say, what else has been authorized as an FDA therapeutic? Are you asking me a question? Because I no, know the no, no, that, that one. Please, please, no, let me. Please go no. ahead. <laughs> Go Not ahead. Fun, right? <laughs> no, no, no. So remdesivir has been authorized. Right. And plasma convalescent serum has been authorized, put on hold, and then reauthorized. Convalescent serum has been authorized. And the chloroquines have been authorized and then removed. Right. So we're in a very elite group, and I believe the only one that is able to be used and known or suspected in home or in a healthcare setting. So it's a kind of very unique pattern. And I, so I would put us in a category by ourselves in some regards as being authorized by the FDA via this emergency use authorization pathway for a home or a healthcare setting in known or suspected COVID. So it's, it's a unique authorization. 
Right. And, and you know, my, my comment about it being the only one, there's none others, is there's no other device That's right. uh, uh, available that you turn around and say this is potentially a treatment. And, you know, it's a specific use case in this particular instance. But you're not stopping there. There's, there's a potential more opportunity and a foundation in science. I mean, there's, you know, an underlying explanation of why this mechanism works. Um, tell us a little bit about what's going on, because there's a number of trials that I think you're uh, in the process of putting together. Yeah, so there are a number of investigator-initiated trials that are going on around the world. When this, we got these ideas together, I spoke with some colleagues in Spain, Carlos Ternero in Valencia, and they were overrun with cases at the time. Um, and he got a protocol up and running pretty quickly uh, and has published his protocol in uh, clinical trials, uh, looking at a randomized control trial of vagus nerve stimulation versus standard of care. Um, a similar trial has been started by Tariq Chima here in the United States at the Allegheny Health Network. These are called Savior 1 and Savior 2. Um, Nick Giannakakis, also from Allegheny, is in the midst of looking at a very large outpatient study. And Sean Hesselbacher is also looking at a large outpatient study uh, for, for patients with COVID. So while I am really encouraged and very grateful to the FDA for taking this seriously, giving us the FDA authorization, which they have done, um, that is based on, you know, three things. Number one, is there a pandemic going? And so, yes, during the course of the pandemic, the authorization is in effect. Number two, does the predominance of evidence look like this is a effective therapy or likely to be, likely to be effective? And, and number three, is it safe? I guess that would be two and three would be the, the second point. And then the final point, is there anything else like it? And what they, what they um, indicated in the letters to us is that this is a unique therapy that is more likely to be beneficial than harmful to the patients. And that, of course, we're in the middle of this pandemic. That's not a substitute for complete science, but it does say, okay, it's a level of security that the FDA has taken a look at this and said, look, if your mother is sick today, we may not have time to wait for all of the double-blinded randomized control trials to, to, to come on, to be completed. We need therapies today. And that's the purpose of this section of the FDA, authorizing the FDA commissioner to do just what he has done here. Um, weighing safety and benefits for patients in the world that we live in today, not in an ideal world. So I, all fantastic news. I think, um, you know, exciting to have a realistic uh, shot at some therapy, unusual therapy in that it's not the sort of traditional chemical, you know, delivery of drugs or some version of that. In, in the remaining time that we've got, tell me what's coming and what are you excited about? Well, you know, the, one of the mechanisms that we believe this work is a profound anti-inflammatory effect. And so when you stop and you think about this, we can go and look in a number of different inf- areas where inflammation is thought to be adversely uh, impacting disease. One is acute treatment of stroke. We're looking at large-scale studies in Europe right now that should be reading out somewhat soon on can we impact the eventual size of a stroke with simple vagus nerve stimulation. Other investigators like Dr. Bremner at uh, Emory University are looking at post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm particularly interested in what he, the work he's doing uh, in that our soldiers need a therapy like this that's safe and effective, and we've not given a, our soldiers or wounded warriors the attention that they deserve and, I, and I'm, you know, got my fingers crossed for the work that he's doing. There are a number of other great investigators. I feel guilty in not listing them all, but I know where time is limited. But these are some really exciting times that we may transform how we think about healthcare in general by implementing very broadly fields of neuromodulation. Fantastic. So unfortunately, as usual, we've run out of time, but just remains for me, uh, first of all, to mention that there's some additional opportunities. There'll be a webinar that's running uh, with some additional details uh, around this uh, concept of treatment and electrocore, particularly around uh, COVID-19 and some of the additional opportunities. Um, Exciting times. Peter, thank you for joining me and sharing uh, your journey. 
Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. Evolution.